God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost but may have eternal life. Identification with Jesus Christ in the mystery of his passion, death and resurrection is at the heart of the vocation of the Sisters of the Cross and Passion. Sisters of the Cross and Passion, who are they? They were founded by Elizabeth Prout in Manchester in 1851, the first congregation of religious women in the northwest of England. The congregation was first known as the Catholic Sisters of the Holy Family. In 1875, the sisters were affiliated to the Passionist Congregation founded by St. Paul of the Cross. They then took the name Sisters of the Cross and Passion and ever since have worn the symbolic Passionist sign. Elizabeth Prout, who was she? Elizabeth Prout was born in Shrewsbury on the 2nd of September 1820, the only child of Anne and Edward Prout. Her mother was a staunch Anglican, her father a lapsed Catholic. Shrewsbury in Shropshire is a medieval walled town, almost completely surrounded by the River Severn. In the mid-19th century, it had a population of 24,000. Elizabeth would have known the 12th century Benedictine Abbey, St. Mary's Church and St. Julian's. Edward Proud, a skilled cooper, worked at the coal and brewery on the outskirts of the town. He earned a good wage and, like all brewery workers, had a free issue of beer. Elizabeth was baptised on the 17th of September, 1820, at St Julian's Anglican Church by Hugh Owen, the vicar. St Julian's today is a vibrant craft centre. Owen, a dynamic character, played a major role in both church and civic affairs. He was a friend to the poor, visited them in their homes, listened to their troubles, and worked hard to make Shrewsbury a better place to live in. This he did with great cheerfulness. Sitting with her mother in church, did little Elizabeth look around her with wonder at the stained glass windows. Christ with the children, Jesus baptized in the Jordan, the Last Supper. Was it here she learned her love for Christ and the poor? We can only guess, but we know nothing of Elizabeth's childhood and youth. The only photograph we have of Elizabeth was taken when she was about 35. She is enveloped in a habit of heavy material. The photograph does not show that she was barely five foot tall, a fragile build, and with hands so tiny that her profession ring wouldn't even fit on the finger of an ordinary woman of the same height. A sister who knew her recorded that she was refined, intelligent, and gently nurtured. She knew nothing but the love of devoted parents, a comfortable and happy home, and bright prospects for the future. Elizabeth celebrated her 21st birthday in 1841. By this time, the family were living in Stone, Staffordshire. Stone was a busy market town. It lay at the heart of England's road system, 
Constant streams of travelers stopped there. It had a thriving brewery industry and about two dozen inns. All the inns were offering Jules ale, and most of them stayed open all night. A cooper, like Edward Prout, would have had no trouble getting a job in stone. 1842 was a year of industrial and social unrest. There was so much lawlessness in stone that year that 700 special constables had to be sworn in to keep order. Elizabeth was living in stone when Father Dominic Barbary founded the first Passionist Monastery in England in Aston Hall. This was about two miles from Elizabeth's doorstep. Whenever Father Dominic walked through the town, gangs of youths pelted him with stones and mud. They hated and despised Catholics, especially foreigners in ridiculous clothes. At first, Father Dominic said Mass in a room in the Crown Inn at Stone. Later, he moved to the new church of St. Anne's. Dominic Barbary's arrival was a turning point in Elizabeth's life. She met him at a time when she was longing for some deeper spiritual reality. Her thoughts were turning to Catholicism, and she felt she must follow her conscience. This was a serious decision at a time of fierce anti-Catholic feeling. Effigies of the Pope were burned publicly on Guy Fawkes night. It was dangerous to be a Catholic, to go over to Rome would involve immense sacrifices. And so it was. When Elizabeth became a Catholic, her parents disowned her. Elizabeth's next step was again dramatic. In 1848, she entered the convent of the Infant Jesus in Northampton. Her parents were shocked. Six months later, she developed a tubercular knee. The doctor said she would never walk again. She had to leave the convent. When Elizabeth returned to Stone, her mother nursed her so well that she walked again. But when she wished to go to Mass, the situation became so intolerable that she decided to leave home. This time, the decision was final. Beggared and alone, Elizabeth made her way to Manchester, looking for work. Her immediate future was bleak. She talked it over with Father Gaudentius Rossi, a passionist priest she had known in stone. He had given a mission in St. Chad's. Father Crosskill, the parish priest, was looking for a schoolmistress. On his recommendation, Elizabeth got the job. During the Industrial Revolution, huge populations swarmed to Manchester and the north of England, searching for work in the newly opened factories. Many were Catholic, famine refugees from Ireland. Here they lived, worked and slept in deplorable conditions. Children from the age of five worked long hours in the mills. They could neither read nor write. Thousands were without any religious instruction. St Chad's Parish in Angel Meadows was Manchester's worst slum. It was known as the lowest, most filthy, most unhealthy and most wicked locality in Manchester. Here, Elizabeth taught, and in her spare time, sought out the waifs and strays in the slums of the city, encouraging them to attend school. She was soon joined by young women attracted by her way of life. Living, working, and praying together, this small group achieved a remarkable amount of good in the school, in the parish, and in the workplace. In St. Chad's Parish, with the help of Father Godentius and Father Crosskill, 
Elizabeth founded a congregation of sisters who would bring the compassion of Christ to the suffering and deprived she saw all around her. Sometimes a shuttle flies out Gives some poor woman a clout There she lies bleeding But nobody's heeding Who's going to carry her out Of the teeth of the Early in 1851, Elizabeth and companions rented a small house in Stock Street. Here they lived according to a fixed timetable of prayer and work under Elizabeth's direction. In this house in simplicity, poverty and obscurity, the congregation of the Sisters of the Cross and Passion was born. Well, this is one of the historic places, you know, for our congregation and, in, in fact, the, the cradle of our Passionist Sisters. It was here to this city mm. that we're looking at that Elizabeth came and it was known as the shock city of the age in 1849. In this street here, Stock Street, she found lodgings from the little house in number 58, Stock Street, she set out every day to walk to St. Chad's, limping because of her, her, knee. her knee, her tubercular knee. On the 21st of November, 1852, the First Sisters received the religious habit in St. Chad's Church. Elizabeth took the name Sister Mary Joseph. Two years later, six were professed. Of these, only two persevered, Elizabeth Prout and Mary Taylor, both converts. Elizabeth Prout's rule was different. There was no class distinction among her sisters. No dowry was required for admission. The sisters were to be self-supporting, doing any work in keeping with their religious state. At the time, this seemed revolutionary. Elizabeth was now offering religious life to anyone who felt called. Lack of money was no obstacle. This way of doing things gave rise to suspicion, endless calumny and constant criticism, all of which Elizabeth accepted as sharing in the passion of Christ. What did Elizabeth Prout look for in her followers? A desire for self-surrender to God's love? Devotion to our Lord in his passion? a spirit of selfless service. In the early years, the sisters served in Manchester, Levenshulme and Ashton under Lyme. In 1855, they went to Sutton, St. Helens. In 1864, they moved to Bolton, a large manufacturing town where they taught in schools, established a teacher-pupil training centre and opened homes for factory girls. The congregation began small, but Elizabeth dreamed of an international missionary congregation, limited only by the limits of the earth. In 1855, Father Gaudentius was missioned to America he was replaced by another Passionist priest, Father Ignatius, formerly George Spencer. His colourful life and conversion was front page news in every English newspaper under the heading Aristocrat Turned Monk. During the next ten years, the strong support of Father Ignatius was vital. It was the most critical period of Elizabeth's own life and the life of the infant congregation. 
Her faith and courage were put to the test. She suffered criticism, slander, betrayal, isolation, and financial ruin, brought about by people she trusted. During all this time, she followed the advice of a good friend. Humble silence. When you are looked upon as dead, then you will rise again. And this is what happened. She was not broken. Her work endured. Undaunted by opposition and wretched health, Elizabeth set about revising the rule of the congregation. The final draft was presented to Rome and approved in 1863. In August of that year, the Congregation of the Sisters of the Cross and Passion was canonically established in Manchester by Bishop Turner. For both Elizabeth Prout and Father Ignatius Spencer, it seemed that their mission in life was over. Within weeks, Elizabeth fell gravely ill. She died as the Angelus bell was ringing at the convent in Sutton on the 11th of January, 1864. Later that year, Father Ignatius, on a journey in Scotland, fell suddenly ill by the wayside and was found dead. In 1973, the remains of Mother Mary Joseph, Elizabeth Prout, were exhumed from St Anne's Cemetery, Sutton. She was buried nearby in the new St Anne's Church, beside Blessed Dominic Barbary and Father Ignatius Spencer. The church and shrine are now a place of pilgrimage. Elizabeth Prout was dead. Only a handful of sisters remained. But among them were exceptionally talented, vigorous and inspired leaders. One such was Honora Chambers. Another, Jane Dury. Honora Chambers was a young Irish girl from County Clare, open-handed and merry-hearted. She took the name of Sister Mary Margaret. When she was 29, she became the Superior General. She was to lead and guide the congregation with vision and courage for many years. Honora was a born leader ideally suited to the challenge of stabilising and expanding the growing congregation. Her first daring venture was to make a foundation in Bulgaria in 1873 at the time of the Bulgarian atrocities. The mission flourished but after 17 years conditions were such that the sisters were forced to withdraw. Who could have foreseen that the Sisters of the Cross and Passion would return to war-torn Eastern Europe in the mid-1990s. 1878 proved a landmark year for the congregation. The first foundation in Ireland was made at Kilcullen, County Kildare. This mission weathered the hardships of the post-famine era and the ferocity of Ireland's struggle for independence. It stands today a beacon of excellence for Irish education, culture and heritage. The novitiate established in Kilcullen in 1928 provided another fertile training ground for countless young Irish women called to serve as Sisters of the Cross and Passion in Ireland and in mission lands throughout the world. As numbers grew and the mission expanded, Honora dreamt of building a large convent to provide a fitting home for the congregation. This dream became a reality when Mount St. Joseph Convent was opened in 1882. Mount St. Joseph became the mother house of the congregation. From here, generations of sisters have been missioned to go out and spread God's word 
even unto the ends of the earth. Honora Chambers died in 1898. The seeds that she had sown with such hope and courage took root, spread, and still today yield a rich harvest. Jane Dury was a Scot, a convert, a brilliant educationalist. Before her conversion, she had been headmistress at a very successful school in Bolton. Just a week before she died, Elizabeth admitted Jane Dury to the congregation. For the next 20 years, Jane Dury, Sister Mary de Sales, was to devote herself to the training of Catholic teachers, sisters and laywomen. These would go out and light up the darkness of poverty and ignorance, transforming society, giving hope to the poor. The Education Act of 1870 made education a right, not a charity. The church needed certificated teachers. The sisters responded. They were called to work in parishes throughout England, Scotland and Ireland. With Jane Dury's expert training, they were well equipped to meet the challenge. Jane Dury died in 1883. Eleven years later, the first Scottish foundation was made in Berninau. From 1902, secondary education became a priority. Grammar schools were needed. From small beginnings, the sisters laid the foundations of a fine tradition of Cross and Passion Colleges. Bolton, 1902. Bradford, 1905. Manchester, 1920. Irvine, 1921. Ballycastle, 1924. These colleges provided a ladder out of poverty, opening the doors to universities and professions. In 1912, Sisters waved off by Mount St. Joseph pupils set out on a white star liner for South America. To get to their final destination, Chile, they had to cross the Andes on mules. 1926 brought the sisters to Argentina to begin an ambitious educational project. This later became Michael Hamm Memorial College. In 1924, they answered a call from Rhode Island, USA. Once I built a tower up to the sun. Each new venture, a new world, a new language, a new culture. It needed courage and imagination. During the 30s and 40s, numbers grew but there were few new foundations. This was an age of social and political unrest, the Great Depression, speakeasy and jazz, economic depression and war are times for retrenchment, not expansion. The war years brought communication problems. Before easy air travel and reliable telephone links, it was difficult to keep in touch. Two world wars almost severed connections with the mother house in Bolton. This inevitably created serious misunderstandings and tensions for missions developing in different climates and cultures. Can you spare a After the Second World War, there were many new foundations. The first was in Ireland. In 1945, Maryfield Convent and College were founded in Dublin. The first pupils were taught in the Tigeen until the new college building was completed and officially opened in 1946. Maryfield College is still a thriving secondary school for girls. 1952, the centenary year of the congregation, saw the sisters en route for Bekuana land, now Botswana. They were to help an emerging nation to get on its feet. In 1953, the new Maryfield Convent was opened. The novitiate then transferred from Kilcullen to Dublin. In 1968, sisters went to Wales. In 1975, to Sweden. 
in 1977 to Peru. In 1986 to Jamaica. And also in 1986, a pioneering sister went to do medical work in Papua New Guinea. The 50s and 60s were the glory years. The post-war baby boom was growing up. There were new freedoms, new technology, more money, better food, wider opportunities for education and careers, especially for women. It was the age of idealism, civil rights, flower power. Ban the bomb. The Beatles, love, not war, was the slogan. Novitiates were overflowing. Buildings and works were expanding. But this was not to last. Times were changing. Oh, the times they are changing. Yes, times were changing. In 1950, Pope Pius XII called on religious to review their role, to go back to their origins, to do as their founders had done and interpret the signs of the times. The call came more forcefully in the Second Vatican Council, opened by Pope John XXIII in 1962. It came again in Pope Paul VI's encyclical Populorum Progressio. And louder still, from Latin America in 1968 in the Medellin documents. Religious were called on to make a positive option for the poor. As Latin American bishops woke up, shock waves were felt throughout the Universal Church. The response of the sisters in South America was swift. Sisters changed direction and went to live and work side by side with people in the shanty towns of Buenos Aires, Santiago and Lima. Special general chapters of the congregation were held in 1968 and 1969. The chapters examined all aspects of the sisters' lifestyle and mission. This brought about drastic changes. Leaders looked to the signs of the times. Sisters were called to personal renewal. Community lifestyle was reviewed. Sisters withdrew from cherished works. Large buildings were relinquished. Reactions were strong and varied. Dismay, anger, anxiety, excitement, hope, enthusiasm. A new vision of religious life was emerging. The road was unclear, for some unnerving. For you who walk, there is no road. The road is made by walking. Looking back, you will see the path you will never tread again. For you who walk, there is no road, only a mirage in the sand. In the 70s and 80s, many sisters left the congregation and few joined. Serious decisions had to be made. Should the sisters withdraw? into self-preserving security and so fade out of existence? Or should they, like Elizabeth Prout, go forward in hope? Courageous leaders chose life. Like their foundress, Elizabeth Prout, Leaders of the congregation took to heart the words of the Lord to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The general chapter mandate of 1995 firmly pointed the way forward. Go to the desert where nobody goes. Go to the periphery, 
where there is no power. Go to the frontier, a place of risk. In the third millennium, what are the Sisters of the Cross and Passion about? Where do we find them? We find them with marginalised people in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Papua New Guinea, USA, Jamaica, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Botswana. We find them in war-torn Eastern Europe, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Romania. We find them at the heart of reconciliation in Northern Ireland. They are involved with people in addiction, suffering from AIDS, refugees, hungry, homeless. Retreat houses welcome anyone seeking pastoral support or spiritual renewal. They serve as chaplains in hospices, hospitals, prisons, universities, schools. They are involved in community development, ecology and green issues. They are trying to build bridges through multi-faith and ecumenical work. The associate program extends the spirit and work of the Cross and Passion family. Let us touch everything we see and change it to hope. Let us look at everything that could be, believing it will be. Where do the sisters find their strength? In the Eucharist. In the shared vision of a praying community. In joyful celebration and friendship in the triumph of the cross, in the conviction, Behold, I am with you always. Today, the Cross and Passion Sisters look back with gratitude and forward in hope. They are inspired by heroic women, saintly souls growing old in the service of the Lord, their active ministry ended their mission now to pray for a suffering world. They are challenged and encouraged by the vitality and vision of new members. Elizabeth Prout was an unlikely foundress, but she did her work well. 150 years later, her vision lives on. These are her followers today. The faces in the photographs, heads all held high, not afraid to look life in the eye. They are women of backbone, keepers of the flame, with a spirit even hard times could not tame. I know the same blood is in me. I meet their gaze one by one, eyes strong and clear, I feel them near. It's a golden opportunity for me to be able to work with the generation who will be tomorrow's future. Something which I came across recently, which I think sums up what we're trying to do, it was an Aborigine woman said, if you've come here to serve me or to serve us, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with ours, then let's work together. I have received an awful lot from them. I hope that they have received a lot from me. They have given me hope, and I hope that I have given them hope. What is Elizabeth Prout saying to her sisters today? Go to the desert where nobody goes. Go to the periphery where there is no power. Go to the frontier a place of risk. May the passion of Jesus be always in our hearts.